the good party is proposing a 999 rand basic income grant for unemployed South Africans. Now, the party says this could materialize if government cut back on some of its expenditure. Currently, the monthly social relief grant is 350 rand. Well, the good party member of parliament, Brett Heron, is joining me now to elaborate on their proposal. Ms. Heron, thank you very much for your time. Let's try and... Uh, I'm not going to say do the maths because I was never very good at that. <laughs> Let's talk about this 999 rand and where you think it could be extracted from. Well, the, um, I think the start point is that um, we have to accept, um, I think, as South Africans, that there is, there's no more effective delivery of, of um, services in South Africa than making sure that poor people, um, people without an income, are able to, um, to meet their most basic needs. Um, and so the, the question of whether we need a basic income or not, I think should be settled by the idea that um, between 8 and 13 million people who are expected to live on zero rand per month is, um, is morally and legally unsustainable. The Constitution guarantees them the right to social assistance. And the 350 rand per month that was introduced during COVID was the start or the foundation for introducing a basic income in South Africa. Um, and that we as, a, as South Africans who have some means need to accept that we can't expect um, that people to live in our country, South Africans to live in our country that is not generating jobs um, with zero, with zero on, on zero income. Mm. The, um, the, the finding of this is possible if you turn the question around as, we, as from whether we can afford to do it, whether we can afford not to do it. And we've commissioned research um, and trawled through different programs and different uh, government expenditure and identified that if there was political will um, and we agree that the most basic needs of human beings, food and water, need to be met before um, we do anything else as a state, yeah. then we can accommodate about 120 billion rand a year that we'll probably need to fund the program um, or this, this overhaul of social security. Um, it is a fraction of our 2.4 trillion rand expenditure um, that we've budgeted for in this financial year. I mean, it's not even 1% of, um, of, of our total uh, government expenditure. And if we are more efficient in our allocations, if we embrace zero-based budgeting as we said we were going to, then government can find the funding for this. Mr. Heron, how would you respond to those who are going to say, well, you know, we, we're going into an election very soon. That's next year. The good party is trying to score some browning points here by creating a welfare state. Why am I saying this? The social relief of distress grant, which is the 350 rand, that was introduced because of the COVID times that we were in then. And yes, we're in good. You have the elderly in our country who can no longer expand themselves in terms of getting out there to look for work because of their age. However, the 350 rand the number of people, a good number of people who receive that money are young men and women who have lots of energy, who can get in employment and actually find that they are able to earn their keep. How would you respond to a skeptic who's going to say exactly what I've just said, that you are trying to create a welfare state? Well, I think that, I mean, that, that response from the skeptics is the one that we should expect to receive. That, um, that people should go out and find work and that young people have the energy and have the ability to find work. And there's no doubt that there are, um, almost nine million young people who are unemployed and who are willing and able to work, but our economy is not generating the jobs that are required in order to give them the opportunity to work. Um, and so for as long as our economy is not generating, uh, jobs, um, and it's, and, and it's our growth is anemic. Um, we, we are left with millions and millions of South Africans who would like to work, 
um, but who are unable to find work. And so the most dangerous thing, I think, for our democracy is for young people to lose hope and confidence in our democracy and what it and what it delivered. Um, and no South African between the age of 19 and 60 who doesn't have any other form of income should be expected to get up every single day and face the day with zero income. So we're not a, this is not a debate about social welfare versus jobs. Mm-hmm. They're not binary choices. We would like the economy to generate enough jobs to absorb unemployed people and give them a life of dignity and a life of earning at least a minimum wage. Um, this is a, this is about your constitutional right uh, to social assistance, which Section 27 of our Constitution guarantees, but also it's a moral decision. I mean, do we as South Africans of means really expect people, can you, can you just put yourself in someone's shoes who wakes up every single day to zero income and no chance of getting a job? That's not the, the debate is not about jobs versus this. It's about providing social assistance for as long as our economy is not generating enough jobs to all the unemployed. Yeah, and that's a very harsh reality because that's exactly what people are subjected to on a daily basis. Let's then make the link between government wastage, government corruption, versus what this money that we are proposing, 999 Rand, uh, could be channeled uh, toward that uh, basic income grant. Is this catching fire in Parliament? And it's a good thing I'm talking to you because you're one of those that sit in Parliament. Yes, you may sit in opposition benches, but are you fighting hard enough? Um, you know, I think that if people, South Africans, look back on our track record since good has been in Parliament, and we, we have, we are a new party, so we've only been there this term, this is our first term, um, we have been a consistent, perhaps irritating voice on basic income. Um, Social Development Minister will will no doubt acknowledge that every time um, we are engaged in any um, debate with her, the good party is there saying, when are you implementing basic income grant? How do you tell South Africans who are now depending on 350 rand per month, which doesn't even meet half halfway to the uh, the food poverty line, that this grant will end in March 2024? Um, it's got 8 million beneficiaries. And we've, so we've been a consistent and perhaps irritating voice in Parliament on this issue. Um, and it is gaining traction because the Minister of Social Development has now, in the most recent question that I asked her about this, responded that she agrees 100% hmm. that it's not a question of whether we need this grant. It is how we do it um, that is the question. So moved from if to how. I think what needs to be factored in is what is the amount that people should be receiving. Yeah. It also does appear that the good party is not just looking at government wastage to say that's where some of these funds could come from, but you also seem to be suggesting that the reduction of provincial legislatures, provincial executives, and the allocations uh, to those offices could actually be used, again, and uh, channeled toward this fund, does that mean that the good party is now actively advocating for, indeed, something that I think has been under discussion in the ANC for a long time, and that is to say, should we reduce the number of provinces, or should we actually even have a provincial government versus just a national and local government? Is that where you are as a party? So, I mean, as part of our research, we had to find where we could find this about 120 billion rand that we think we need to fund um, a basic income guarantee or basic income grant of 999 rand per month. Um, and so there are, there are, I mean, there are various components to our plan. One of them is about allocative efficiency. So that means looking at both national government departments and seeing where there's duplication and where uh, departments could be merged and ministries merged and the amount of savings we can derive from that. It's looking at provincial legislatures and saying um, the provincial legislatures on their own in terms of the cost of, muni- of members of the provincial, the MLs, is about 4 billion rand a year. 
the nine premiers across the, the country, the cost of the premier's offices is 6.5 billion rand a year. So that's just in the political space in uh, nine provinces. There's 10 billion rand a year being spent. Now, the, the, uh, the, the debate that we must have is about whether that is allocatively efficient. Are we getting value for money for 10 billion rand being paid to MPLs and to the premiers? Um, and is the solution to find transversal um, um, solutions? In other words, why not every province have its own IT system, its own communications team, its own, why can't that be shared? Or is it about reducing the number of provinces or about eliminating them? Hmm. Um, we haven't um, landed at saying provinces should be eliminated, but we do say that there needs to be a national discussion around whether Provinces are more important than food on the table, mm. and whether we'll get value for money out of that 10 billion rand that um, goes towards the political office bearers um, in in provincial legislatures. Given that you've given, uh, given that you you have uh, you've given some thought to this, Mr. Heron, is the use is the effective use for provincial governments to exist because. A very crude um, analysis says this is just the ANC creating jobs for comrades. And that's at least the one view that I've heard of. Do you, do you really think that there's reason for why there should be a provincial government as opposed to just the two spheres of government, national and local government? So, I mean, if you go back to our 2019, uh, the Good Party's 2019 manifesto, which is the, our launch manifesto, we, um, we've set up quite clearly that the future around the world and, and so, and South Africa is very much part of the world is, um, rapid urbanization to the point where by 2050, um, almost, I think 85% of all people will live in towns and cities. So we are a rapidly urbanizing world. Um, and therefore, powers and functions should be devolved, the appropriate powers and functions should be devolved to cities and towns so that, it, that they can prepare for the kinds of cities and towns that will be um, in, a, in a largely urbanized world. Um, the, the question about the, the, the provincial parliaments or provincial legislatures or the provincial sphere of government, I think the idea that this is just a way for ANC cadres to be, to be employed or to be given opportunities is probably simplistic and crude because the, um, the decision to have provincial legislatures was a, a compromise that was reached um, in negotiations for the 1994 elections. Uh, and it was a compromise that was largely demanded from parties that are now in the opposition benches who um, were afraid of perhaps the hegemony of a of a, a large dominant ANC government. And so they wanted some powers to be retained regionally. So it's not so much that it was the ANC that was pushing provinces. If I recall correctly, the ANC didn't want provinces as part of the, the constitutional settlement of nineteen ninety four. Mm. But certainly now, um, and, and me having I served in a provincial parliament or the West State Provincial Parliament and while I was there, I did question whether this was a good um, use of resources yeah. because there are very few powers that provinces have and it's a very expensive uh, sphere of government to operate when it has no real powers. Brett Heron, let me thank you very much for your time and uh, indeed a worthy conversation to have. He is uh, a member of parliament representing the good party.